So welcome everyone to today's Human Genomes Platform Project final project showcase. Uh, it's great to see uh, many familiar faces from the project team and some new ones uh, in this virtual room. I think we have a few new people or those that we, we don't often see. So welcome and thanks for taking the time to join us today. My name's Jess Holliday and I sit within the Human Genome Informatics team at the Australian Biocommons as Program Manager. Most of us know each other in this virtual room, but we need to cater to the YouTube audience. So if the speakers could please very briefly introduce themselves, just as I did before they present, that would be great. Next slide, please, Pat. So just on to um, some, some housekeeping to get us started. As I mentioned before, uh, this meeting is being recorded and you will have seen a prompt come up on your screen. We will make this recording public on the Biocommons YouTube channel once permissions are obtained from the speakers. So if everybody could please remain muted and if speakers can observe their time allocations, um, that will help things run smoothly. Pat has shared his screen, as we can see, and he'll move through the slide deck with the speaker's prompts. So just send him a, just give him a prompt when you're ready. I'd also like to, before we begin, acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Next slide, please, Pat. So on to the business for today. What, what is the plan? There's a link to the agenda uh, in, embedded in that slide. It's in the chat. It's, it's in the calendar invite. So grab it from any one of those locations. And the aim of today is for us to come together for one last hurrah and to showcase to our key stakeholders the major outputs and outcomes that we've delivered across the HGPP over its almost three-year lifespan. And we'll proceed as follows. I'll open with some um, context setting and then give a, a broad overview of the whole project before handing over to um, my colleagues to present on each of the sub-projects that encompass the project. And we have five of those sub-project presentations. We'll close with some final steps to wrap up the project over the next couple of weeks and then some acknowledgements and final remarks from Bernie and maybe Andrew Loney as, as the leads at, at our end. And Knowing Bernie, he's hopefully got a few quips lined up to inflict upon us um, in his final remarks, so we can we can look forward to that. On to some scene setting now. What is the current state of human genomics data sharing and analysis in Australia? Next slide, please, slide. please, Pat. Well, we're we're generating huge huge amounts of human genomics data, and we don't have a national strategy or a coordinated solution for how these data are stored, managed, queried, and shared in in a responsible fashion. And so, what inevitably ends up happening is that research institutes um, hold on to these large amounts of of valuable data assets, effectively locking them up in in silos and, and isolating them. And so we're then unable to derive the full value from, from these um, data assets through integration and reanalysis. Some data does get sent to the European Genome Phenome Archive or the EGA, uh, which is a service for permanent archiving and sharing of personally identifiable genetic, phenotypic and clinical data. Uh, but the submission and access process to the EGA is challenging for a number of reasons. And so recognising the current state and the challenges that exist in this space, the Human Genomes Platform Project, or the HGPP for short, um, came about and, and this collaboration formed to make it happen. And so the HGPP represents a major project for us within the Human Genome Informatics Group at the Biocommons. So what is the HGPP? 
Well, it's a it's a large collaborative project designed with those challenges in mind that I uh, highlighted earlier and brings together leading genomics research organizations and infrastructure providers around the country to investigate and implement global standards and technologies to Australia and improve the overall state of human genomics data sharing and analysis. It's jointly funded by the ARDC, uh, Bioplatforms Australia, and also contributions from each of the participating uh, organisations. We started in early 2021, uh, and we are due to wrap up within the next couple of weeks. And ultimately, what we want to deliver is a services toolbox based on emerging global standards. We have five work packages or sub-projects that, that encompass the, the project. Uh, virtual cohorts, which we define as the ability to discover multiple data sets across many data sources that match a researcher's criteria of interest. DAC approvals, uh, which is investigating and implementing tools that help to um, automate and streamline the data access process for the data requester and the data custodians. Federated identity and access management is looking at how we can ensure uh, researchers can securely access human genomics resources across Australia within their trusted institutional identity. Data and metadata archiving is looking at ways to facilitate the, uh, the process of long-term archiving of Australian human genomics research data including exploring the feasibility of setting up a federated node of the EGA. COMS documentation uh, and training is, is sort of wrapping up all of those uh, sub-projects and making sure that those intended end users are able to, to use and deploy these solutions um, that, that we've been investigating. And on the right-hand side, we can see all of the, the partners engaged uh, in the project, including universities, research institutes, and computational infrastructure partners. So what's in our services toolbox? We have gone through a knowledge discovery phase to map out our business requirements and use cases. We have identified the candidate uh, technological solutions to, to tackle our challenges. Uh, and then we've gone through a, a pilot testing phase to evaluate those solutions against our requirements to determine their fit and, and their scope for longer term um, in a longer term production phase. So that's sort of the process we've gone through. We've tried to follow the, the principles of open source, global standards, building on what is out there rather than building new things uh, and documenting our experiences along the way. And in each of those boxes, we, we can see the, the, the different solutions that we have um, focused on in each of the sub projects. So I'll now hand over to Mustafa, Cam and Conrad to very briefly introduce themselves and tell us about the virtual cohorts sub-project, please. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Jess. My name is Conrad Leonard. I work at the Queensland Institute of Medical Research. I'll be giving a quick overview of the virtual cohorts project, and then I'll be handing over to Mustafa and Camille to present all the fantastic work they've done. So just to start with what is almost a truism that uh, clinical and genomics, clinical and research data is uh, of most value when it's discoverable or findable in the FAIR um, parlance. But it's also true to say that um, perhaps the reality of that has not caught up with everybody's best wishes. Uh, in terms of what that means for us in Australia, the partners on this project have been some of the largest generators of data, uh, genomic data in Australia. And they each tend to have a different focus. It's largely disease focused. There's some other research around ageing and so on, but it's within disease, it's quite a different focus between the different institutes. And I think it's true to say that there's a real desire to share and share alike appropriately. It's not just about accessing other people's data. People want to share their data with others. 
but currently there is no way to identify nationally cohorts of people that have had their genome sequenced. So as a broad overview of the requirements, we need a system to identify and query cohorts of individuals and their related data assets. Um, so drilling down a little bit, that means we need a common approach to the annotation of the data, in particular the uh, patient level and clinical information, which is always the most difficult part of the exercise. We would like the partner organisations to manage and host their own data. We don't want to silo it all off in some big uh, repo where we say, give us all your data. Um, in terms of what that means from a technology point of view, we need to implement a distributed search query framework or an API. We need a user interface for the casual user to explore the data. So that you don't need to programmatically access it or programmatic access is essential. And we've always, as stretch goals, had integration with the other projects in mind. So particularly around um, authentication and authorization, so access, controlled access to the data. So the very first thing we did um, after community needs analysis, we did a more detailed requirements gathering exercise because this is the basis for which you choose your technology, which you choose your solutions. So across the participating organisations, we polled users with different roles. It was important to get a, a wide variety of use cases. So we polled researchers, clinicians, uh, data custodians, and asked them to give us very specific things that they would like to do within the context of virtual cohorts. Uh, and there was a lot of commonality between these, despite the different roles that we hold over. Uh, next slide, please, Pat. So we then surveyed the landscape of existing tools around genomic data sharing. We don't want to reinvent the wheel, and ideally we want to adopt global standards. You can see that uh, many of the technologies listed here are annotated with GA4GH, which is the Global Alliance for Genomic Health. And that's sort of an umbrella organisation. It's worldwide, lots of participating organisations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if they approve a technology, then it's, you know, it's at least accepted prima facie as, as a good approach to the problem. And some of these technologies here are overlapping. So this is not a disjoint set here. These are not sort of their own little bubbles. Uh, the FINA packets is quite a low-level protocol, Data Connect likewise, Gen3 is a very powerful data analysis platform if you have all your data already on site. Uh, what we ended up settling on to best fulfil the requirements we had was the Beacon project, which you see in the bottom right corner there, the nice little logo. They've managed to work a double helix in there, well done. Okay, why did we choose Beacon? It's a GA4GH standard. The specifications and the tooling are open. Just my timer going off telling me I'm over time. Uh, it allows federated data sharing and it has the best over functionality overlap with the requirements of the virtual projects, virtual, sub, virtual cohort sub project, I'm sorry. So I'll now hand over to Mustafa. Thanks, Conrad. I'm Mustafa Sayed. Uh, I work at Children's Cancer Institute. So I will give some more information on the architecture before exciting live demo by CAM. So one very important aspect of genomic data sharing is securing access to data and providing right level of data access. So there are three types of data access uh, you can provide with Beacon. First one, a public, which is open to everyone with or without login. Second one is registered access, which is access to users that are registered and have a valid account. Then the third one is for the highly sensitive, uh, for which uh, you, you like to give access only to a subset of registered users and not all registered users. So you can see there is a placeholder in the API uh, for uh, types of data access. With these three types of data access, Beacon is quite flexible on one end and secure on the other end. So you 
you can open data set to everyone or to a registered uh, set of users or to a small group of controlled access users. So you will not lose the ownership of the data. You will have the full control of the data access. Also like Beacon can uh, return responses at different granularity. It can return Boolean response, whether the data exists or not, or it can return a count response, number of records, or the last one is the result set where it returns uh, details of every collection along with the uh, count of matching results. So next slide, please. Now you can see this is the architecture diagram. Each partner site hosts a lightweight beacon backed by data from data source, uh, data store exported via scheduled ETL process. So creating an ETL process and mapping the internal to the shared data model is the work unit that is required by each of the site. Individual beacons are registered and communicate with the beacon network. Now there are two versions of beacons. You can see here version one, which was more focused on the variants only. Uh, so now, so you can make a query like present or absence of a mutation on a federated network of beacons. Version two, which include genotype, phenotype, uh, and uh, clinical metadata about samples and patients. So you can make a lot more powerful queries involving not just the genotypic data, but also phenotypic data and clinical metadata, such as gender, age, disease, sample types, et cetera. So basically you can make a more real world queries with the beacon v2 you can query these beacons individually using beacon apis uh, beacon in on themselves are quite effective but they are made more significantly more effective with the introduction of beacon network to build a beacon network you need three micro you need to run these three microservices first one a database microservice, which is a Postgres database uh, that is stores details on all registered beacons. A registry microservice uh, to register beacons and to keep track of different beacons that are participating in a beacon network. And the third one, which is um, uh, what we are more interested in, is the aggregator microservice. It sends out queries to all beacons in the network and gather the data back. So it's kind of like brain of the network. Next slide, please. So that was the architecture we began with. Later, we made some changes and this is the current architecture. We have two different types of beacon implementations. UMCCR has set up a standalone beacon implementation and CCI has uh, implemented uh, has set up a reference implementation. UMCCR is serving a slice of a uh, Sinica uh, dataset. CCI is serving data set, uh, data from Prism landscape data, landscape study, along with a slice of Sinica dataset. When the beacon was deployed at the BioCommons, we removed two of them, two microservices that they use to manage beacon registration and beacon metadata. We are now only using aggregator microservice from beacon network package. We have also secured uh, a beacon UI, beacon network, and each individual beacon using CI logon. And next slide, please. So we have come long way these two or three years from discovery phase, uh, research, uh, researching current state of art and various solutions to selecting a technology and pilot implementation. But there is a still, but it is still like a plant that is burning out of a seed. So a lot of possible extensions uh, or improve, improvements. To begin with, we can extend the data model we at least need to ha have a place for SVs, structure variants. Then we can extend query. At the moment, we are only utilizing single API endpoint to query individual entity. We can query all other entities here. 
uh, we can query all these uh, entities using the API endpoints that are already available. We are also just displaying results from individual entity. This view can be extended to display data from all other entities. Also the search interface uh, allows limited ontology terms in the dropdown. We can make this a free text search, but that free text need to be converted to respective ontology terms used by different beacons. So we need to add a ontology mapping service to the beacon network or to the UI. Though the public and registered uh, data access has been tested and works fine, we is still we are still working out solution for control access. And last but not the least is the integration. We have already integrated. Uh, we have already uh, shown the integration with federated IAMs, uh, but uh, we we still need to work out uh, integrate. Uh, we also need to integrate other solutions from DAC and Data Archive. So now I will pass on to Cam for a live demo. Um, so essentially, we've got um, the landing page here, um, and this is the just a statistical overview of um, all the cohorts that have been registered within the network. Um, th essentially, the main takeaway from this page is that you don't necessarily have to log in to see um, some amount of data, um, but there is a, a CL logon button here, which which we'll get back to in just a minute. So if we can go to the explore page, um, and this is essentially the bread and butter of the user interface. So what we can do is we can um, We've got uh, the summary view here, which is essentially um, essentially boils down to just two um, graphs here. We've got um, uh, the distribution of individuals across the top 10 diseases that have been registered across all the cohorts. Um, keep in mind, this isn't all the diseases. It's not comprehensive. It's just the 10 most common uh, diseases. Um, same thing for here. It's just a sex distribution across the 20 instead. And you can see that across the male and female. Um, in this tab, we have the table view, which again, I'll, I'll get back to in just a second, um, which is just gives you a more tabular granular uh, level of uh, data viewing. So within here, we've got the add filter button um, and that brings up a little modal and we can uh, filter on the individual's uh, node within the data model, which Mr. Fowler did here. Um, and within that node, we can search for a specific disease, for example, neuroblastoma and uh, this query in its simplest form can just be uh, executed here and we can see it propagates, it gets sent off via the aggregator and it aggregates all the information here. So now we can see we've got 21 patients um, that have been diagnosed with neuroblastoma, um, 13 of which are female and eight of which are male. Um, and we can construct slightly more complex queries. So for example, we can add gender as well. And if we do male here, we can expect a uniform distribution, which is exactly eight male. And this is essentially, um, uh, by virtue of this being a proof of concept, we've focused only on the individual's node within the data model for now, but this is quite easily extensible and it can be extended towards um, uh, genomic variants as well and searching within certain positions within the chromosome. Uh, so if we clear all of these and we apply that, we get back to our baseline. And if we go into the table here, we can now log in via CL logon. And um, until you have logged in, you won't be able to see any granular data. Um, now, CL logon is essentially the middleman, which um, allows us to get authenticated. Um, there are several different um, institutes and organizations that have been registered via CL logon, and which is essentially a way for them to be validated as trustworthy sources, which can be authenticated against. Um, for the purpose of this demonstration, I'll just be going with Google. Um, now, hopefully this doesn't ask me for a verification code. Perfect, there we go. So now we're back here, we've been redirected and we're now authenticated. We can log out here via this button, but before we do that, we can go back to the table view and now we can see essentially all the different rows. Um, and if you noticed, sorry, I did forget to mention, Initially, he, we have um, a, a count of all the records that have been retrieved from that given query. So this baseline query with no filters, we've actually got 1,253 records. 500 of them are from UMCCR with the Seneca test data. The other 500 are from CCI's Seneca test data. And then the 252 are CCI's landscape data. Um, and then within this table, you can just kind of see 
essentially every single individual that has been passed from that period. And you can see all the diseases and you can search and sort and filter from here. And you can see which institute and which um, which beacon instance has provided that information. Um, and yeah, that, that's pretty much it. Thank you. I'll pass it back to Jess. Thanks, Cam and Mustafa and Conrad. That was fantastic. And now on to our second sub-project presentation by Sarah and JP, please. Thanks, Jess. So I'm going to kick off. Um, Sarah Kummerfeld from Garvin. Um, I'll present the first half. Uh, before I get into it, though, I wanted to mention a few people who've been absolutely critical for this project. Two of them are not here with us anymore. Um, well, they're still alive. They're just not doing this project. Um, Kylie Davis and Marion Shadvolt, who were really um, incredible, and especially in a lot of the documentation handling user stories, would not have gotten this far without them. Um, Andrew Patterson and Matthew Hobbs have also been really critical for the, um, the technical implementation. So just call it out from the start. All right, if we go to the next slide. So where this sub project fits in is thinking about how do you streamline data access committee management? So this is not managing the data access itself, it's managing access requests. So we sit, oh, well, you can't see my mouse, but the nice blue section um, of the diagram is, is where this piece sits. So if we go to the next slide, up until now, um, anyone who is handling managing data access committees um, knows that it can be a complete nightmare. Um, I, at Garvin, our previous approach was a lot of email flying back and forth. Um, and it's really hard to have a solid paper trail where you can see exactly who's requested what and, and what's been approved. And um, you have to, you get requests from a user and then it has to go to many people for approval um, and then consolidate and get that information and come back. So this was trying to address that problem. So if we go to the next slide, the process that we went through was first uh, to compile user stories. And so many people on this call helped a lot with that process. And I think it was helped by the fact that a lot of us have experience with that email nightmare and not just email, sometimes paper and PDFs that have been scanned. So we knew the, the painful things and, and, and where we wanted it to go. Um, then extensive documentation of the requirements and setting out test scenarios that I'll talk about a bit more. The team identified two solutions that we wanted to explore um, as possibilities to solve this problem. One is REMS, which is the one we've actually carried right through, and the other is DUAS. Um, so we'll talk a bit about those in a minute. So REMS, uh, as part of the project, was installed a test instance at UMCCR that um, Pado set up, and then we also have a production instance at Garvin, um, which we also use as part of the process for, for testing things. There was um, analysis of how REMS matched up with our requirements and worked through the test scenarios. We had a, um, a series of tests where we, we ran these test cases live with different people sitting in different, uh, actually in different states, um, playing the roles of different uh, components for, for this type of workflow. So we had someone acting as a user, someone acting as a committee member, someone acting as a um, committee manager. Um, and it was really great way to see firsthand how this these systems work. Maybe it's worth saying now that Duos was one that we, we put aside because after some back and forth with the Broad team, we decided that it just could not meet enough of our requirements because it's very much tied into their system. Um, it could be a great tool if you're using their ecosystem, but for us where we, we wanted it to be broader and um, serve people with different requirements, it just was not a fit. So that's why we, we didn't explore it any further. We've also had really good interactions with the team, the REMS team. They are really quite open to adding features. They want to know why the features needed and who needs it and how many people need it. So they're not going to just add things for the sake of adding them, which I think is a good sign actually, but they're very responsive. Um, and that's been a really good sign for um, the fact that this tool is something that's got longevity and, and they're interested in hearing what users need. Um, and if we go to the next slide, this is just an example. I don't want to take you through all the details, but of the sort of um, test case that was mapped out and then um, we actually tested 
uh, as a role playing with people in different areas. Um, so you can see the types of things that people are asking and how they're interacting with each other. I think the message really from this slide is that there are a lot of people involved in this um, in quick succession. So there are a lot of different types of users that you have to have in mind. All right, next slide. So I'm going to hand over now to JP to take through a case study. Okay, so, so weirdly, I'm going to talk about the Garvin use um, Garvin instance uh, and and this in all honesty this this is a potent piece of the choice for rims as well as we have a local user who can tell us that it actually works it can be used and um, you know that's that's not nothing when you're picking a solution finding someone who says it's it's not bad uh, further to what um, what Sarah's already said too that there were very few alternatives she said we tested two I think we tested the only two that looked really credible. Um, and REMS did cover a lot of the requirements that we defined and nothing covered all the requirements. There are some other little pluses that, that I, I think are handy, um, which Duos couldn't meet. You can deploy in cloud. Um, you can do just local installs of the bits and pieces if that's your, if you're a tech guy and that's your thing, or you can ro roll it with Docker. So, you know, there's multiple ways to um, to host and deploy rims it's open source which is pretty pretty powerful it means we could extend it ourselves if we wanted it's written in closure which i think is a um, a little bit of a niche language um oliver raised his eyebrows it, it's a it's a functional language in the lisp family but it it compiles down to bytecode targeted at the, at the jvm so for the java heads you know it lives in the same ecosystem as java um, it has a strong user community in Europe. That's a good thing. The Elixir folks actually use it. Um, and that also means it's in development. I went and had a quick look at the contributions in GitHub and it's it's still rolling now. So it's not, you know, it's, it, I've adopted plenty of dead projects in my life because they still look useful, but it's really nice to see a live project um, and be picking that. Okay, so um, so next slide, please. Okay, so... These are obvious things, but these these are important things. So this is this is Garvin. Um, they have high value access control data sets. I'm betting most of us look like that. There, there is some genomic data that you can share openly. So in our world, in the cancer world, we can openly and freely share somatic variants because they don't really tell you who a person is. But most of the rest of the human genomic data that we'd all be holding has to be controlled access. And so you need a data access control, you need some mechanism, like data access control committee in this case. Each cohort has a separate data access committee. This is QMR roles like this as well. We have, um, I think I have 300 genomic projects um, that, are, that are completed or running at the moment. And every one of those has a separate data access committee. Once it, well, they don't all have data access committees yet, but once they hit the point where we publish their data, the folks who are involved, the clinicians who are involved in generating the data, they're not necessarily happy to hold full control, to hand full control of the data to QIMR. So we have clinicians involved in our data access committees. That was one of the things that was going to be very hard with DUOS. They, they had a different, they had a different thought pattern that there would only be one data access committee per organization. So that would have been difficult for us to map to, and, and Garvin looks like us. And anyone can use from around the world can request data access. And uh, and data Garvin's data science platform folks are the data custodians, and that's how QIMR works as well. Uh, my group act as data custodians for all the genomics data uh, in the institute that comes through our hands. There's always islands of um, islands of folks who like to do their own thing, but if it if it comes through the central facility, uh, we control it just like Garvin. Okay, next next one, please. Okay, so the overview of how. Um, of how REMS is organized, there are there are quite a few user roles, as Sarah showed uh, on, the, on the previous screen. Um, there's, there's data owners, um, there's organizations, there are reviewers, there are approvers, there are deciders. Um, but at the heart of it, the heart of it, if you look at if you look at the under the um, under the hood of the schema, everything starts with RD, meaning research data. So it really is a system where everything is centered around the concept of research data. Um, if you look at the top of that screen, you'll see uh, 
you'll see there's a there's a, a login so we know this is Matthew Hobbs um there's menus the menus will change a little depending on your role you can have you can obviously have any one of the many roles you could be a data owner um as well as a data decider and you could I guess potentially be a data applicant as well if your if your institute has um if your institute has good processes and you have to apply even internally for accessing data so you could you can have as many roles as are required in order to um, to do your job function. This is a catalog. This is showing um, some data items. There there are actually many things in a catalog. I find catalog a little confusing, but you know, in in practice, um, research data is at the heart of things. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, this is showing one of the resources catalog items. This is Garvin's MGRB. Um, which is a, la a large collection of germline genomes that Dave Thomas put together. I'm not sure if Dave is still the, the boss of MGRB and, and quite a few of us use this. This would be something that you could apply for access for. You could be an applicant for this um, catalog, catalog item or resource. Uh, next, please. Okay, open application. So anybody can apply for, for data. Uh, and then it depends on then, then there's a there's a workflow there uh, it's one of the good things about rims they, they take a little bit of getting used to I, I would not say i'm i'm not a rims an active rims user at the moment well, workflows take a little bit of thinking through but work workflows tell you how an app an application well the main workflow i'm familiar with is the one that shows how an application is going to flow through the system there are a couple of built-in models for how it flows through. You could have a simple model or you can have a more complicated model where there's multiple rounds of review, but you, you can define your own workflows if you wish. There is a distinction um, in RIMS, a, a nice distinction between reviewing and approving. So you can have folks who are members of a data access committee who review things, but individually they have no power to actually do the final release. So you could have uh, it would be easy to implement a model whereby you had a chair for the committee and that chair was the person who actually approved the final um that the application was uh was approved you can define with each as you define or you create each data set or define it inside the system you can um you put together a form that tells the user um, about the data set you can add you can add data collection there, so folks have to tell you something about themselves or about their proposed uses, which is extremely handy if you're trying to match up against your consent forms. Um, and those can, there was some there was a little bit of inflexibility there. We had a little bit of difficulty formatting things. It had a couple of odd behaviors. Um, I think everything's a paragraph essentially, but but it's a it is a relatively good system, um, and you can have many applications. Obviously, you can apply as many times as you like. Uh, and this is just showing a set of open applications. Okay, next, next slide. So this is this is showing um, a large number of processed applications, all for all for MGRB. Uh, it, it's got it's got relatively um, sensible reporting, but that reporting is not extensive. So I think it's entirely likely that folks like us would want to add some reports on top. But, you know, basically applications flow through the workflows, they get approved or they get not approved. And next, and I think last slide. Okay, so th there are some there are some opportunities given um, the architecture of the thing. The API is pretty good. Um, I'm pretty rusty, but even I managed to create um, some, some code that accessed the API and pulled things in and out. So I think um, any competent program is going to have no difficulty ac ac accessing the, the API. Um, REMS as a service, we I think we discussed this a couple of times, wondering whether it would be possible that rather than all of us standing up in independent REMS instances, there might be a chance that someone would wish to um, stand up a shared REMS instance. That's probably worth continuing to discuss um, you know, I think I think if someone trustworthy were to stand one up, we would potentially consume that service rather than try and run an, a REMS instance for ourselves. Uh, but we, we would need we would need to test that. Um, yeah, and I think I think the, the the API for me was was the key thing. It means that no matter what 
hole you think the system may have now, you can potentially try and fill that hole. Uh, and I guess I hope that if any of us do start filling holes or adding reporting, I'm hoping that we'll all share that code as well so that when one of us makes a step forward with REMS, others will get to benefit. I think that's it. Can I add one more thing? Because I think this oh, yeah. is the, it's something where we're heading. Um, we did notice that the, while this handles the data access committee piece, it doesn't actually get you to having data access. Yes. And so there's still a bit of that email world. And so that's something that Pado is now driving through ELSA, um, the data release coordinator. I don't know if it's going to be covered later in the seminar, but um, I think that's something really important. That's an opportunity which sits outside of this, but is closely tied together. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Sarah. We had in our requirements, didn't we? But it just wasn't a thing that anybody was going to tick for us. I think that's achievable um, using some of the, the federated identity and access management tools. But um, like you say, we we're more focused on the just the workflow and the actual approval process. But I think it's technically possible to automate um, access to a data set, but obviously things are going to get even more variable at that point because you're going to be dealing with different technologies, different data repositories. But I think it's all theoretically possible anyway. It's, 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 it's a, I think it's much better than a closed system where we can't put our grubby little fingers inside. I think it's always, well, what good bioinformatician doesn't want to put their finger inside the software and stir it from time to time? <laughs> and on that note, thanks, Sarah and JP. That was a really lovely story about what we did in in the DAC sub project. And by the way, I think we may bank up a few minutes at the end for some questions and comments from the audience. So please do note them down and we'll see how much time we have at the end to tackle them. But now on to John and uh, Andrew for to tell us about federated identity and access management, please. No problems. All right, so I'll, I'll go through most of it and uh, Pado can chime in with some extra things at the end if need be. So next slide, please. Um, so yeah, essentially we've got a, a network of organisations uh, spread out across the country and potentially even internationally down the road and we need to be able to have a shared view of who the users are that are interacting with this system. So um, federated identity management becomes really important in this, this universe. Um, we're using common internet standards, so uh, things like SAML, OpenID Connect and OAuth at the technical protocol layer. Um, and on top of that, we're using things, standards from bodies like ReFeds and GA4GH um, to describe how you work on top of those technical foundations and how we actually do the functions that we need to do. Next slide, please. Um, we've already seen this diagram, but that identity piece kind of sits at the center of this. It enables a common view of who our users are, and that helps us get in and use different um, components of the, of the network, like the virtual cohort system and beacon, um, like REMS for approving access to data, and potentially also for populating documentation when we get to that as well. Next. Um, so broadly, what we're doing is using institutional credentials, so your identity that's issued by your employing organisation, Garvin, University of Melbourne, University of Sydney, whoever that might be. Um, so it's the login with Google type concept, but we've got more extensibility and control around that. And it's built on the, the network that the Australian Access Federation has already assembled. Um, so that includes nearly all the universities around the country and many research institutes. And it gives a consistent view of who the users are that are interacting with all these systems that make up the, um, the federated network. Next. Uh, in terms of goals of this particular sub project, so it's really, this is a foundational supporting piece. So um, I often say to people, no one ever comes and says, can I have some federated identity management, please? Um, you need to be able to log into systems, but they're the real, that's where the real work happens. Um, so we've worked very closely with the other sub projects to try and uh, flesh out the requirements uh, for those services. Um, we have participated in some global IAM standards work. So PADO has been involved in defining the specification for GA4 or GH passports version 1.2. Um, we looked at the requirements and gaps uh, for those other projects. We investigated some options and recommended a few different solutions. 
And then we also did some technical pilots for the most promising candidates. Next slide. Um, so that standards work, so Pato was involved in both uh, defining um, that particular specification, uh, which, you know, we, we had sort of conflicting views from what the NIH wanted and what the Europeans wanted in terms of the standards. So um, Pato is a good voice of, of reason and pragmatism, I think, in that. And we've, we've got to a workable standard, which has now been published, which is great. Um, so feeding information in both directions there. Um, but the important thing, I think, is passports is a really advanced use case. Um, we have explored that and we've kind of confirmed that it is workable in some advanced use cases. But we do need to work be walk before we try and run. Um, there's some really much more basic foundational things that we need to get right before we start trying to tackle these advanced use cases. Next. Um, so the main gap that came up through the requirements process was this, this thing around community management. So broadly what that is, is for users of a community like the human genomics community to self-organise and to manage who the members of this group are and to configure access to services and to define different levels of rights. Um, we looked at a bunch of enterprise systems, um, some open source systems and some other solutions. And the one we landed on, which met the majority of the requirements was CI Logon. Um, that's actually kind of developed by the National Centre for Supercomputing at the University of Illinois. And they've developed this solution initially to support the needs of um, uh, high energy physics, but it's expanded to a whole lot of other disciplines as well now. Next slide, please. So uh, this is this is kind of what AAF looks like. This is not an actual example, but a kind of a, a, a bit of a fictitious example. So on the left-hand side, we have um, identity providers. So these are organisations that create identities for people. So it might be University of Melbourne, it might be the Garvin Institute, it might be QAMR. And on the right-hand side, we have service providers or applications that people on the left-hand side want to use. So it could be things like Beacon and REMS and the MGRB data set and some other cancer data sets. Um, so we just advance one more again. Um, so the benefits of this are we can do authentication to web services. So if you're working for one of those organisations on the left, you can at least log in to anything that we plug in on the right. Uh, it gives you coarse-grained access control. So you can do things like, I will only accept users from Garvin Institute and QMIR, um, but you can't get down to, I want a group that contains Jess and Pato and me and JP, and we want to be able to access this particular application. When you get down to that level, it's just kind of too hard. Uh, you get single integration for applications. So we plug in that cancer data set too, and anyone in AAF can log into that at least. What they can do in the system is up to that, that cancer data set owner, but we can at least get people logged in. Uh, and it works great if you're a subscriber to AAF. Uh, next one, the limitations though, uh, we can't do that fine-grained access control we can't do consistent authorization across services. So if we want only Jess and Pato and JP and I to access all of those services, we've got to update that group in five different applications. So that means five different organizations have got to coordinate and get that all happening at the same time. It's just never going to happen practically. Um, we can't do non-web applications. So um, though we haven't done anything much in this space yet, high performance computing is going to come in here. It's typically all command line driven and because of the protocols that AAF uses, it's all web-based. And this is a web browser in the flow. Um, it just doesn't work. And we've got a bunch of non-AAF organisations involved and we have no, we have some workarounds. We don't have neat ways of um, doing that at scale at the moment. So after HGPP, so what's on the screen now is what we had. If we advance one more. We've introduced CI Logon, and that sits in the middle between AAF and, and between those services. Uh, advance again. What it does though, is opens up a whole lot of other identity sources. So it's connected to a thing called EDUGAIN, which is the Federation of Federations for Research and Education. So uh, AAF is in there, the US Federation in common is in there, 
the UK Access Federation is in there, and there's about 80 different federations around the world. So we can now, potentially, if we want to, allow access to people from other countries as well. But it also adds social identity providers like Google, GitHub, and Microsoft. Um, so we can potentially use those as sources of identity too. Uh, advance again. Uh, so we can also now plug in HPC applications so we're not limited to web browsers. And advance again. And we can also add attribute authority. So these are other bits of information that are relevant to users and we can kind of plug in and embellish the identity that we already have. So things like ORCID, for example, really handy in research. We can pull in a person's ORCID ID and then we can push that around to the services so that if they need that data to help make a decision, um, that's available to them. Uh, one more advance. So the benefits, many more organisations involved. I mean, Edugain has about 5,000 identity providers around the world, so lots more there. Everyone just about has a Google, GitHub or Microsoft account, so we can incorporate more people that way. We can now do fine-grained access control, so that authorization bit in the middle through groups and roles and creating access tokens for people. Um, we can manage those groups at the centre and we can make that information available to all the applications on the right, so you fix it once and it's consistently applied through all the applications in the network. Uh, we can do that identity augmentation and we can also link identities. So we can take an AAF identity and we can bind it to a Google identity and the end user can use either of those and we know they're the same person. And we can also integrate non-web applications. Uh, next one. So look, we've already seen a couple of examples in the previous demo, so I'm not gonna do a live example, but a couple of use cases, um, just logging into an application. So we used a group control here, so people could only log into the ELSA data application if they were a member of a particular group that permitted access to that. So it's not just, Everyone who's plugged in can log in. You need to be specifically nominated. And next slide. Um, so we also experimented a bit with this concept of a bona fide researcher. So um, someone who's registered in the group uh, either by someone else in the community vouching for them, or it might be by looking at their ORCID data and looking at their research outputs and kind of going, yes, we can see that this person is an active researcher. Uh, and then we can pass that information out to the Beacon Network um, and use that to provide a higher level of insight into the data sets that are available. Next, um, so a few bonus points. So these weren't specific goals of the projects, but um, some extra things we got along the way. So some new features in CI Logon. So it didn't support GA4, GH passports and visas. It does have some basic support for that now and more will come as um, as we need to build that out in the future. Uh, and there's some UI for self-registration of OIDC clients. So at first it was, um, hey, CI Logon team, can you add this new client for us? We've now got some basic UI to be able to do that ourselves and more improvements will come as we move along. We have CI Logon running in Australia data, Australian data centers. So it was all in the US when we started. We've now moved that all across to Australia. Um, it improves response times, but more importantly, it avoids potentially awkward conversations about data sovereignty. So we can say, yes, all the personal information about users stays in Australia, we're not shipping it overseas, and that, that makes it just a lot easier to um, get people on board. And we recently conducted a uh, third-party independent penetration test against CI Logon. Um, it is resilient to typical cybersecurity attacks. There were no critical or high findings, and most of the other findings that um, were made have already been remediated. So um, we're pretty confident in the security of that system, which is important when we're dealing with human genomic data. Next. Um, so I guess in terms of the, the future, how does this roll into Guardians? Uh, we deliberately decided not to do much in the way of um, IAM policy. Uh, so there's a thing called the ARC that stands for um, Authentication and Authorization for Research Communities. Um, so they've got a policy kit that deals with things like what policies do you need about managing your members? What policies do you need about data security and privacy uh, and, and data protection and privacy and security incident response? So we've just put that to one side for now and just focused on technical proofs of concept. Uh, but we will need to tackle that. Um, and some of the policies are kind of reflected towards users, like an acceptable use policy, 
others are reflected towards the service providers or the applications that participate in the network. So, you know, we kind of need to get on the same page around expectations for, you know, um, what does QAMR versus Garvin require in terms of user identity verification? Um, are they the same? Are they completely different? Have we not even thought about that? Uh, and, and we need to get on the same page there. We will need to get to a like production grade service. And I'm talking about things like service level agreements and support channels and commercial models and all of that type of thing. And we also need to expand our inclusivity. So it's great for the project team, but what about hospitals? What about government? What about industry? What about small research organizations? Um, and we need to find ways of bringing them into the fold as well. I'm not suggesting for a moment that we do all this all at once in Guardians, but they are things that we need to think about down the road. And I think that's it for me. Pato, anything you want to add? No, nope, that was a good summary. Thanks for doing that, John. That's it. Yeah, think, thanks, John. That, that was excellent. Let's move on to our fourth sub-project now, data and metadata archiving. We'll hear from Joe, And this is, as Sarah was saying, uh, Marion Shadbolt, who was previously with us at the BioCommons, has now moved on, but she had a very um, big hand in this sub-project and co-led as a sub-project lead with, uh, with Joe on this particular sub-project, as well as being active in, in all of the others. So... Um, just wanted to mention that, but Joe is flying solo today. Over to you, Joe. Thanks, Jess. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Joe Copti. I'm the production bioinformatics lead at the Garvin. Um, and as Jess mentioned, I've, um, yeah, I'm going to be talking about uh, data archiving and metadata. Uh, next slide, please. So the aims of this sub project uh, were to understand the needs of the stakeholders for submitting and also sharing the um, data sets in international repositories and the challenges that they face there. Uh, we also looked at uh, some of the options and the requirements for establishing a national human genomics repository in Australia. Uh, we also provided technical insights into the implementation uh, that we chose. Uh, I'll talk more about these as well and then um, um, yeah, so the, and the link to international communities, platforms, standards, and solutions that, that are already out there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so some of the things that we uh, did in this uh, project were, uh, so we looked at different existing controlled access repositories, including the uh, European uh, uh, Genome Phenome Archives, which is EGA. Uh, dbGaP is another repository, which is located in the US. And Terra is, is a um, is a cloud-based sort of genomics platform built by the Broad Institute. So uh, we determined the, the Australian community needs by gathering requirements for three types of users. So we um, we we had a workshop with the partners in this project to um, determine these requirements and the use cases that we were uh, interested in, and then we also identified that there were three main types of users that that are interest, that, that are involved in this process, including data submitters, the data consumers, and then the data custodians. Uh, we also provide recommendations on preferred approaches and technologies. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and we uh, ended up landing on the federated EGA model um, as, as our recommendation in our report. So what is the federated EGA model? Um, so uh, it's it's basically using uh, the same um, software as they use at the EGA, but in a federated way. So you can have different nodes across different countries that store and manage their own data, but they're all sort of linked to the central EGA repository um, to be able to search these, um, these different nodes and um, request access through uh, DAC or um, yeah, similar systems. Um, so having this federated EGA model means that each um, country can have their own uh, human genomics repository. You can have several of these nodes as well, if you wish. Uh, sensitive data files will remain within that country. So that's one of the benefits of having this federated model. 
public metadata is stored uh, at the central EGA, so you can query, you know, the one uh, one location for the data across the different nodes, which is really handy. Um, and it also provides you with a recognized EGA accession for any of your publications, um, and which is also super handy. And it it will follow the same metadata standards as the EGA. Um, yeah, and each each node will um, take on its own, I guess, tech stack uh, in how they want to develop and build their node. Um, so there's already several implementations out there, and each each one varies in where they've built their system and how they how their users interact with it. So you do have some flexibility there. Um, and it also links to other services um, that that I'll go into a bit later. Next step, please. Um, so why did we uh, decide on the Federate EGA? Um, so there's uh, a lot of experience at the central EGA itself. So they've got 15 years. They've been running this uh, repository for 15 years and have accumulated over the over time 13 petabytes of data, which is humongous. Uh, there's an active global and growing community of support. Um, there's uh, a lot of countries that have already adopted this, although they're mainly in Europe, but um, there's also other uh, countries that have expressed their interest in, in developing their own federated EGA node and joining the network, um, which is a, a, a huge plus. Uh, existing well-maintained software to build on and customize so we can we're able to build our own modifications if we wish, wish to it's fully deployable locally with full control over hosting um uh, on the plat on the platform and having the data there uh, there's existing guidelines and policies um so which we can build upon and that we can also uh, provide an internationally recognized accession that will be accepted to by publishers, and there are many other advantages that we highlight in our report. So the next slide, please. Um, we did a pilot test of the software um, that's available on GitHub. Uh, so the the technical implementation that we conducted, um, we uh, installed on VMs that were hosted on uh, the NCI engineering cloud. So this was work uh, mostly done by Andrew Robinson from the NCI. Um, and there were two different implementations that we tested. One of them was provided, uh, was it's called the local EGA, which is provided by um, the, the EGA themselves. And then there was another one called SDA, which stands for Sensitive Data Archive, which is the Nordic Infrastructure Collaboration um, instance of the, of the implementation. Sorry, yeah. Um, so what we did for each one of these uh, implementations was installing them. We ran some basic testing. So there's some self uh, test scripts that you can run to check that all the modules are working. Um, we tested basic data ingestion uh, into the system. Uh, we we uh, also a code review, which involved basic, you know, just looking at the code, making sure that there's active development and and some progress and 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 um, on those repositories, the code repositories, um, and yeah, assessing the developer community and how active they are. So the the winner out of these two implementations was the the Nordic uh, implementation. Um, so the reason and it's already in use in production in uh, these three countries that we know of, so Sweden, Norway, and Finland. Um, and uh, I, I, the reason that we we decided that this one was the preferred option was because it passed all the uh, basic testing, which the other one didn't, and we didn't actually have, uh, we didn't want to spend too much time in trying to troubleshoot and debug and 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 do all these things. Although uh, a lot of the other tests did pass, but um, like the data ingestion did actually work, but some of the the basic testing uh, did not work for on that one. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next slide, please. Uh, so the main output from, from this sub-project was our report in which we highlight our findings um, and, and summarize all the work that we've done. Uh, there's a lot more stuff in the report that 
that I haven't talked about yet and I won't go into, uh, including govern governance, legal considerations, some infrastructure and staffing requirements to build uh, a federated EGA node. We also describe what an MVP would look like, so a, a minimal viable product, and also went into the next steps after building the MVP, which we call the MVP plus. And this uh, schematic on the right shows what an MVP plus would be. So essentially, what we what we highlight is the MVP would be just installation of uh, an EGA node and, and a federated EGA node, and make sure that it's connected to the central EGA node and get it working and with basic support. And then the plus will add on all these integrations into the systems that have been discussed already by the other sub projects, including Beacon, uh, REMS, and CI Logon. Um, and a few other additions like being uh, attaching the data to compute and um, perhaps also um, you know cloud compute if, if that's what users um, would like. And then, um, yeah, so that's basically the ecosystem. Um, yeah, and so then the, the future work and next steps is that we are hopeful for to get the funding to establish this Australian federated node, uh, federated EJ node, or maybe several if that if that's what makes sense, uh, following these recommendations. Um, and then, the, as I mentioned, the integration with Beacon, Rams, and CI Logon. Um, I, I do want to mention as well that it, um, so the, these recommendations are based on the information that we we had at the time of writing this. Uh, as the, there's active development, there might be some some additional stuff that are added uh, to the to the implementations that you know are worth also considering um, once this implementation is done. And I think that's is that all the slides I have? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's me. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. That was fantastic. And now on to our last but not least presentation uh, by Jeff and Christina, which really you know pulls these different uh, sub projects to together. Um, and we've heard many references to. Um, all the really nice outputs that we've generated across the, the project. Uh, and so we'll hear more about that now. I think Jeff is presenting That's right. uh, this segment, please. Thanks, Jess. Um, I'm Jeff Christensen. I'm the Deputy Director of the BioCommons. Um, uh, for me, it's actually been really uh, pleasing to see all of these outputs because um, I was working with a lot of people here at the initial stages of when we were, when we were applying for the AIDC funds for this project and really coming up with the ideas for the work packages. So it's it's fantastic to see how this is how this has come along. But today I'm going to talk to you about uh, the comms documentation and training parts of this uh, activity. Next slide, please. So I thought what I would do is actually look back to when the project started and we we were envisaging that success for this particular sub project would be that there's a rich repertoire <clears throat> excuse me of material available to but importantly findable by IT professionals at other organizations so outside this group who might want to deploy similar solutions in Australia but also researchers or data custodians or DACs who might want to use any of the systems deployed we envisage that the material would cover written documentation, so how to deploy, for instance, um, other reports. We would have self-paced training material. We would have webinars. We were thinking maybe we would have training workshops, but also we wanted to have general comms and raising awareness of the project. And really, I guess what, what we imagine that, you know, one thing this project needs to do to be considered success is to enable that workforce transition of individuals who want to use and deploy similar, similar systems elsewhere. Next slide, please. So um, I'm just going to go through them. So what have we achieved? The first of these is written documentation. First, uh, next slide. So we have a knowledge base. Um, we've been using that to aggregate all of the documentation uh, artifacts from that, that's come across the uh, project. Um, you can, there's a, there's an image there. You can see that it's aggregated or, or we have folders for each of the sub projects. So the child project, uh, the tile payers have been viewed um, about 700, over 700 times. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this really is an aggregator of documentation that sits in many places. So um, we have 
we point to the setup guide. So for example, there's three setup guides for Beacon. There's one at UMCCR that's in GitHub and there's two out of CCI that are in Bitbucket. So they're sitting elsewhere, but next slide. What we do is we, we effectively aggregate these um, and present it through one page. So these are our GA4GH Beacon implementation guides. Next slide. Um, there's also other guides. So there's a guide um, from UMCCR about how to set up REMS in Amazon uh, Web Services. So again, this is uh, sitting in the UMCCR GitHub repository, um, but we aggregate that into the into the knowledge base. Next slide. Um, there are some absolutely fantastic and really comprehensive and thorough discovery phase reports. And I know there'll be one coming for the um, the, the work package that Joe was just talking about. So um, these are uh, describe um, what everyone's been talking about so far. Um, next slide. Um, these are all published as PDFs, but we really want to make sure that others can find those um, and learn from our experiences. So um, they're obviously linked through that knowledge base I was talking about, but what we've also done is we've uploaded them to a, a public document repository called Zenodo. Um, this makes them findable by anyone on the web um, and citable. So the three examples, these are these are screenshots from just the other day. Um, collectively, they've been viewed 562 times and there's been 384 downloads across all of those. No citations so far, but it has a built-in citation tracker. So when there are, we will know about it. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, self-paced training material. Um, I guess this is an interesting one. And I think, you know, my reflection on this is I think the the setup guides and how to set them up, I would argue, are self-paced training material. So I think um, for the audience we're aiming for, for the IT um, infrastructure managers, this is a really sensible way to go. Next slide. And next slide. Um, as far as webinars, we've, we, we haven't had that many. We've had three. But um, again, it's worth noting that all of these are put up on our YouTube channel, the Biocommons YouTube channel, they're discoverable by others, and there's been nearly 700 collective views on all of those uh, webinars. And uh, this, this I think, will be uh, put onto the YouTube channel as well and be made discoverable. Next slide. And next slide. Um, so comms and raising awareness about the project. I think we've had really fantastic um, attendance at, at conferences, both here in Australia and internationally. So uh, just listing them there, there's been the GA4GH uh, meeting in, I think it was in Barcelona in 2022, eResearch Australia in 2022, the Elixir All Hands in 2022, um, eResearch New Zealand, um, Abacus conferences, and the International um, Congress for Genetics, which was held in Melbourne last year. Um, so we've had a lot of presence at that, and I think um, talking to everyone that's been to those meetings, um, it's generated a lot of interest in this project, and people have been very interested in the outputs. Next slide. Um, we also have uh, been producing, I guess, other types of communications. We have some news stories. Um, we have some flyers. One thing that I uh, have just put in the slides, but it hasn't been updated. Is is actually the uh, the uh, the DAC um, the flyer that we just saw that um, that appeared in a in a in a session, um, and it's also worth noting that we'll have a news item in the December edition of the Biocommons newsletter, and that's going to announce the wrapping up of this project and also highlight the outputs, um, and it'll include a recording of this showcase. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we've had uh, lots of social media going on um, from us and all partners, so that's been great. I think these have all been retweeted and viewed many times. Next slide. Um, and next slide. So did we achieve our goals? So this is what I showed you at the beginning. Um, next slide. I would argue that everything with a the tick there, we have absolutely, um, we're moving in the right direction. We are producing outputs that align with all of this. But next slide. Um, there's a couple here where we haven't really moved forward. And I guess one of them is training workshops. I'd say that we have, uh, it's pretty, it's a, a little bit early to be doing training workshops on, on systems that are deployed. Um, and also on the topic of 
of researchers or custodians or users of these systems describing how to use the systems deployed also a little bit early for that. But next slide. Um, I think that this will really move forward in the next phase. So we know that there's a the project's been very successful. It's been pivotal in being able to attract further funding to move this work along. So I think that, you know, we'll really, I mean, the documentation, all that stuff, we're going to continue doing. We're not just stopping now. Um, I I encourage everyone involved in the project, if there's any documentation that, that hasn't yet been made its, you know, made itself visible in the light of day, please let us know and we'll we'll add it into the knowledge base and go from there. But um, yeah, all of this will be moving forward in the next phase, Guardians. And I think that's it from us. Thanks, Jeff. That was awesome. And big thanks to Christina as well, who was very active in, in that subproject and helped us with a lot of the, the comms um, and spruiking all the, all, all the awesome outputs along the way. Now over to Bernie to tell us about our last steps in wrapping up this project uh, and, and a timeline to completion and final remarks and acknowledgements in our remaining few minutes. Over to you, Bernie. Great. Thanks, Jess. Um, we've got another hour to go, haven't we, Jess, for my part? Oh, it's only nine minutes. All right, I better go quickly then. All right, um, I'll cut my speech down to just the bare um, essentials. Um, so the final project outputs um, that Jess mentioned that are emerging are the reports from each of the sub-projects which are listed there. Um, they're all in a um, very uh, excellent state. We're just getting a final uh, go of polish over those um, and some feedback, and then they'll be published um, for um, international, national um, readers to, to look at the, those resources. Um, so we're going to um, include in that a, a write-up for the final Biocommons um, December newsletter as well for our community to, to read. Uh, and then there'll, there'll be a final financial acquittal statement that occurs at the end of the project, just to wrap it up. Um, so the actions um, arising are that um, Jess and I will distribute those final reports for group review by the 4th of December, which is very soon. Um, all all of uh, the recipients of the reports are requested to review and provide feedback um, and approval by the 14th of December, um, which we acknowledge is a tight uh, turnaround time and we thank everyone uh, in advance for their input for that. Um, Jess will submit the final report to ARDC by the 15th of December, and then Jess will also uh, start financial final financial acquittals um, by mid-December, which are due uh, late January um, next year. Next slide, please, Jess. Um, we're also planning to have a project closure, closure survey um, that will be coming out soon and you'll be notified that. And we would really love to have everyone's feedback about this project uh, as well. So stay tuned for that information. Next slide, please. Um, great. So now it uh, falls upon me to um, make some closing remarks. Um, and um, Jess set me up for um, making some jokes and unfortunately I've cracked under pressure and instead written a very serious speech. So brace yourselves for um, a lot of serious words. So hopefully it won't take too long, but there is a lot to say because this um, project has um, got a lot of contributions for many people. And I was reflecting last night um, as I was lying in bed about the Human Genomes Platform Project and more broadly about the work that we're doing in human genomics data sharing and analytics as a community. Um, and I, I was thinking, well, in our busy lives, it's easy to become focused on the sort of technical details of our work. And at times um, like today, it's useful to pause and reflect about the bigger picture of what we're trying to achieve. Um, and I, I'm reminded um, from my own work in, in some ways um, by the highly motivating example of, of cancer patients who have bravely and gener generously donated tissue samples in the hope that research on those samples might aid in the prevention and better treatment options for, for future generations. In, in many of those cases, those patients have undergone substantial extra medical procedures, often quite painful to make those samples available on top of their uh, undergoing their challenging cancer treatment. And this um, um, is really poignant and important. Um, these samples and data flowing from them are entrusted to us as a community, as a research community, and we have a responsibility to make the most of this information for the betterment of everyone. Um, and this is just one example, but it's a reminder of the significance and the, the potential impact of the work that we're doing here. 
Um, most of us can probably remember a world before genome sequencing. It seems um, uh, that genome sequencing is just everywhere now, um, but it wasn't too long ago that identifying a few bases from a human gene would have made it to the cover of nature. Um, but today we're talking about sequencing the entire genome of millions of individuals without really blinking an eye. Um, the sheer enormous scale of this endeavor requires the development of substantial digital research infrastructure at national and international scale. Uh, this in turn requires a significant collaboration, coordination and compromise. Um, and in, in addition to all the wonderful technical outputs we've heard about today in the presentations, I think one of the most important outcomes from the HGP, HGPP project is the community that has been fostered throughout um, the three years. This is a great strength of our work and we're looking forward to building on this in future endeavors. Um, I would like to thank everyone for joining uh, our showcase today and especially to all the presenters who showcased the impressive outcomes from the HGPP. Lots of people have contributed to this project and it is truly a collaborative team effort. Um, it's been an absolute pl pleasure to, and a privilege to work with everyone on this project over the three years. It's, time flies by amazingly quickly. And um, I just remember three years ago, um, thinking about the starting of this project. Um, and uh, it's just incredible that that time has passed so quickly. Um, while everyone here deserves praise for this work, there's a few people that deserve special mention. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Andrew Loney, the principal investigator for HGPP and the, and the broader team at Australian Biocommons for instigating this project and developing the vision that was ultimately funded to deliver what we've seen today. And actually this work um, building up to the HGPP um, extends way back before the start of this project, a significant amount of groundwork was put in place to make this happen. Um, we're extremely grateful to the ARDC and Bioplatforms Australia for providing funding for the project through NCRIS. And I would like to acknowledge the support and guidance from Kerry Levitt and Siobhan McCafferty from ARDC and Andrew Gilbert from Bioplatforms Australia. Um, I've mentioned the highly collaborative aspect of HDPP, and it goes without saying that this project would not have existed without the significant contributions from the project partners whose logos are, are shown on this slide here. The partners are the Australian Access Federation, ARDC, Australian Genomics, Bioplatforms Australia, the Garvin Institute of Medical Research, Melbourne Genomics, NCI, NCRIS, QIMR, Birkhofer Medical Research Institute, the University of Melbourne Centre for Cancer Research, Zero Childhood Cancer and the Children's Cancer Institute. Um, and a really big thank you to all the partner leads for making this project a reality. Um, we received significant guidance in the direction of the project through the advisory group. I would like to thank all the members of the committee for their contributions to guiding the direction of the HGPP. And I would like to particularly thank Clara Gaff for chairing the committee and mentoring Jess and I over the last three years. Uh, Clara was deeply engaged in the progress of the project and very generous with her time in providing feedback and advice. Um, one of the very first things we did in HGPP was set up the subprojects, and you've seen the outputs of their work today. In particular, we are greatly indebted to the hard work of the subproject leads who have been tasked with steering the working groups and ensuring that we achieved our goals. John Scullin and Andrew Patterson led the Federated Identity and Access Management subproject. Jeff Christensen and Christina Hall led the documentation and training subproject. Marie Wong and Conrad Leonard led that sub the virtual cohort subproject. Marion Shadbolt and Joe Copti led the subproject for data and metadata archiving, and Sarah Kummerfeld and John, John Pearson JP led the DAC approval subproject. Um, special mention must be made to Jeff Christensen, um, who was instrumental in framing the structure of the project, assessing the community needs, and helping to bring the project to life. Um, in the very early days of this project, Jeff um, really mentored me through the start of the project, and I'm really grateful. Um, Jeff is a constant source of calming advice and wisdom, and I'm grateful for, to him for all the support throughout the life of the HGPP. Uh, and last, um, but far from least, I would like to extend a big personal thank you to Marion Shadbolt and Jess Holliday in the Human Genome Informatics team at Australian Biocommons uh, for a truly enormous effort in making this project a success. Projects like the HGPP don't just happen on their own. They require significant organisational and management effort, often behind the scenes. In the best run projects, you tend not to notice the engine that drives the work along. And the HGPP is the best run project I've ever been involved with. And I credit that to Jess Holliday as program manager and now program, sorry, project manager and now program manager in the HGI team. 
Jess exemplifies everything that you would hope to have in a project manager. She kept us all organized on track and made sure the project was achieving its objectives and the aims of our funders. On top of that, and most importantly, Jess made it great fun. Uh, Jess has been an absolute pleasure to work. It's been an absolute pleasure to work with you on HDPP and you deserve significant recognition for all its success. Um, and with that, um, we are out of time. Um, so I thank everyone um, very much for today.